Welcome to the Marriage Today Show. I'm Jimmy Evans. Thank you for listening and downloading this show. Our prayer is that this show is helping you to learn how to do marriage God's way. Today, we're going to look back on some of our favorite moments on the show over the past five years. If the only time you're romantic is when you're in trouble, well, that just, it's a guilt offering. I mean, it's really not romance. But you communicate uh, value in many ways verbally. Pet names and praise and verbal affection is one of the ways that you communicate to your spouse. You never cut each other down. You never call each other bad names. You never do that. You, you always speak value to your spouse verbally. You also speak value in what you're willing to give up. When Karen and I went through the hardest part of our marriage, work and golf had replaced Karen. And because I was not willing to give that up, I had devalued her. And the day that I gave both of those things up for her and put them in their right place, I began to communicate to her again that she was the most valuable thing in my life. Another way that we we communicate uh, value is creatively. In other words, by the creative things that we do. Uh, I did my uncle's funeral uh, here in Amarillo and uh, he died, my aunt came to me and she said, uh, Jimmy, will you do his funeral? And I said, sure. And so I was you know, talking with her, preparing his eulogy. Uh, and I said, well, just tell me some things about him you know, so I can talk about him. And she said, uh, listen, they're married for 40 years. She said, every day of our married lives for 40 years, he wrote me a new poem and left it on the dining table. I said, what? You know, there's only so many ways you can do roses are red, violets are blue, <laughs> I love you. And 40 years, every day, he took the mental and emotional energy, and they had a great marriage. They had a great marriage. Think about that. Being creative, coming out of your world, that's how you fell in love. You just, you were creative, and you communicated in many ways to each other how valuable you were And then when you get into the static area of marriage or the entropic area of marriage, all that falls apart. And then number four, way that you create romance is empathy. Empathy means the ability to understand and share the feelings of another person. It means thinking about another person and putting yourself in their place rather than just being completely disinterested and passive and dispassionate. These are the 12 phases of instinctive romantic love. When you fall in love, here's the natural phases of what happens. Number one, awareness, I become aware of you. Number two, interest, I'm, I'm aware of you and I'm interested. Number three, there's some kind of a positive exchange. We talk, we talk on the phone, there's something positive that happens. Number four, romantic interest. Now I desire you know, to be with you romantically. Number five, high emotional focus. I am focused, I'm empathetic. Now you've got my attention and I'm obsessed with you. Number six, positive romantic exchange. Number seven, strong feelings of love and passion. We are falling in love because we're so focused, we're so investing in each other, now we're falling in love. Number eight, deepening relational bonds. Now we're in love, now we have a great relationship. Number nine, normalcy. Routine, lack of novelty, you begin to coast. You like what you have and you just begin to coast. Number 10, reality, conflict, difficulty, fatigue, illness. Number 11, distraction and disinterest. Number 12, loss of romance. Well, let me go back just real quick to Hebrews, uh, to Revelation where Jesus was talking to the church at Ephesus that had left their first love and here's what Jesus said to them. Remember where you fell from. He He tells them, I'm not okay. I'm not okay with you losing your first love. And he says this to them. I want you to remember where you fell from. I want you to repent, and I want you to do your first works. I want you to do what you did at the beginning. Okay, you don't have to work up any feeling. If you're here, if you're, if you're watching right now or listening, and you've lost your romantic love, you don't have to work up any emotions. That's, that's what it is. Jesus said, do you remember what you used to do at the beginning? Related to us, do you remember the way you talked to me, how you sacrificed, how you pursued me? Do you remember that? Okay, good. Now I want you to change your mind. The word repent means two things. It means change your thinking and it means turn around, okay? So he's saying, you're going the wrong direction, I want you to stop. I want you to remember now, the way it was at the beginning, I want you to stop and I want you to begin to do the things you did at first. There was a counselor 
I, I read a report this year about a marriage counselor, I think it was a woman, really smart woman, and she had these crisis couples in marriage counseling, and she said to these crisis couples, I want you to come back in a week. And between now and the time you come back, I want each of you to think of three things that you did when your marriage was good that you're not doing now, and I want you to do those three things. That's very wise. I want you to remember what you did, not how you felt. I want you to remember what you did when your marriage was good, and in the next week, I want you to do those three things then come back and see me. Uh, according to her report, some of the couples would not. That they didn't feel like it. Their feelings, they, they worshiped their feelings, they followed their feelings, and they followed them right into the pit. But some of the couples did. They left her office and they began to think, well, you know, I used to do this, I used to do this, I used to do this. And for the next seven days, they did, without feeling, they did the things they used to do in their marriage. Every single couple who did what she said came back and said, we feel better about our marriage today. Something has changed. Here's what happens. When you do the right thing, your emotions will follow along. Don't worship your emotions. You may be at a place right now in your marriage, you say, I just don't feel like it. I get that, but Karen and I didn't. We just, we just obeyed. We, did, we just began to do, me especially, I just began to do the right thing and our feelings, our emotions were healed. We fell back in love. And so empathy just simply says, I'm focused on you and work, work is not gonna take me away from you and if it has, I repent. The kids are not gonna take me away from you, and if they have, I repent. If anything, if anything has taken my focus off of you, I'm not gonna get rid of you, I'm gonna get rid of it, or I'm gonna put it in its right place. Hebrews 13 uh, says, God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That means two things. He will never physically leave us, and he'll never take his attention off of us. God is emotionally focused on you, and God says, is a promise to all of us, I will never physically desert you, and I will never turn my heart away. But people are very conditional. Did you ever notice that? Pe people are different in the way that they love. But I want you to know that you have a, a friend in heaven. On your worst day, he's your best friend. And he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Somebody say amen. amen. God is our best friend. That's what you call acceptance. Identity. He made me in my mother's womb. Did you know the Bible says that to he who overcomes, when you get to heaven, God's going to give you a stone with your real name on it? Did you know that only God knows who you really are? A week after, I, a week after Karen and I got married, the Lord called me to preach. And I was sitting in the backyard of our house reading, I think, a book by Billy Graham. I don't even remember. Uh, I didn't know one scripture in the Bible and I saw a sheet drop down in front of my face and I saw myself from behind preaching to a multitude of people at 19 years old. There had never been a millisecond in my life I thought of myself as a preacher. Two weeks earlier, I was a very immoral, lost person. And Jesus came to me and said, let me tell you who you really are. People can't tell you who you are. Only G Jesus made you in your mother's womb. Security. I'm only secure in God. I, I can't be secure in anything other than God. God can protect me from anything and anyone. My security is in God and purpose. I don't want to live to make money. I don't want to live to be popular. I want to live to change the world for Jesus. I want an eternal purpose. You know, a lot of people that kill themselves, they just can't find a reason to live any longer. They get discouraged, they get depressed, and they just they, they can't find a reason to get out of bed and, and live anymore. Let me tell you something. When you live for Jesus Christ and when you live for the kingdom of God, you'll always have a reason to get up the next day. My purpose is not just for myself. My purpose is not just to make money. My purpose is not to be well-liked. My purpose is to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that is an eternal purpose. And that's a big purpose. Acceptance, identity, security, and purpose. And if you don't trust Jesus to do that, you're gonna trust people to do it. It's called the principle of transference. And every time you try to get a person to meet those needs, you'll ruin that relationship. So listen to what I'm saying. Your daily, personal, trusting, dependent relationship with Jesus Christ 
is the most important issue in you being a good spouse for someone sometime. When you get married, that person can't meet your deepest needs. And if you expect them to, the, the relationship is set up for uh, d- disappointment, disaster from the very beginning. So you were made for marriage, but God has to be in the center of that marriage. And I'm not talking about just having a Christian marriage. I'm talking about you've got to pray. You've got to depend on Jesus. And so a lot of people, a lot of Christian people, they don't depend on Jesus. I want you to make me feel secure. I want you to make me feel like somebody. I want you to accept me. And they get into these fights of, you're not meeting my needs. Well, there are needs in marriage that we meet for each other, but not the deepest ones. Only Jesus Christ can meet our deepest needs. So if you want to be the right one for someone later in life, you need to have a relationship with Jesus, a real relationship with Jesus. And so here's how to establish and maintain the right priorities in your marriage. There's two steps. One is they have to be proven in real terms, not just words. It, you can't just say you're first in my life. You have to prove that your spouse is first in your life. And here are four ways that you prove your priorities in marriage. They're very simple. One is sacrifice. What will you give up for me? It's real, it's real simple. What will you get? Golf, or, and golf is of the Lord, is that <laughs> golf almost ruined our marriage because Karen, early in our marriage, I golfed all the time. Karen wanted me to give up golf. I told her, I said, no, but you can come caddy for me. It was a near-death experience. I saw the white light, the whole thing. And is that I wouldn't give up golf for her, but I didn't understand why she was so upset. What will you give up for me? Now, I want you to listen to me just a minute. Now, the, the second one is time. Sacrifice, what will you give up for me? The second one is time, consistent with priority. If you're telling me that I'm first, there has to be time. Time is the commodity of relationship. Money is the commodity of business. If I wanted to keep you from being successful in business, I just have to keep you away from money. If I can keep money from you, you'll never succeed in business because money is the essential commodity of business. Time is the essential commodity of relationship. To ruin your relationships, all I have to do is keep time away from you. And there's the old saying, if the devil can't get in front of you and stop you, he'll get behind you and push you too fast. And people are going too fast. And they don't have time for family. They don't have time for each other. And we have to cut back. What will you give up for me? And how much time are you going to give me? Let me say this. When Karen and I got married, there weren't cell phones. There weren't computers. There weren't fax machines. There weren't cars. There weren't, no, there weren't cars. We had cars back then. But listen, there weren't computers and cell phones and all that. So when you were with a person, you were with that person. If, if you were on a date and you were like eating dinner, you, it was just you. No one else was with you. Today, we have so much electronic intrusion into our lives. And when you're dating, here's what happens. When you're dating, your phone rings and you look at it and turn it off. Wh- whoever's calling you, you, you turn it off because it's like, sorry, sorry. Someone's trying to get a hold of me, but you're more important. You're more important. I'm gonna sacrifice talking to my friend because of you. When you're married, you take the call. <laughs> and what happens is, some, sometimes it's okay. Sometimes you're together and it's a casual getting together. But I'm telling you, there's sometimes I'm with Karen. She, I don't want her talking on her telephone. And she doesn't want me talking on my telephone. And what this means is I'm going to sacrifice being connected to everybody on earth for as long as it takes for us to bond. And let me say something electronics are great, and I believe in technology. It's a good servant, but it's a terrible master. It will destroy your relationships if you don't discipline it. And so when I'm with my wife, she, she belongs to me first. I belong to her first. And I'm going to say no to people who are trying to intrude on this so we can have a conversation without it constantly being interrupted or something like that. Now, you know, there may be an exception of the kids are home and the house is on fire, something like that. You <laughs> go ahead and take the call, you know, but... Number two, so you have to prove your priorities. By the way, four four ways you prove your priorities. Sacrifice, time, energy, and attitude. There has to be energy. It can't just be your home eating chicken, watching sports. You know, it's, there has to be some energy behind it and an attitude. The attitude is I want to be with you. This, you know, you're not a ball and chain. I really want to be with you and it's good. The second way that you prove priorities is you have to constantly protect them from good things out of priority good things out of priority. Most of the things that destroy marriages aren't bad things. 
There are good things out of priority. Let me give you an example. When I went into the ministry, Karen and I had a real problem early in our marriage with golf, work and golf. And I hung up my golf clubs for several years and it healed our marriage. Because what it communicated to Karen is, she was first in my life. And, and I gave her then the time that golf was taking from her. And now she doesn't mind if I play golf because she knows that she comes first. But when I came into the ministry, I, I was in business before I came into the ministry. The Lord healed our marriage. People started coming to us for marriage counseling. Uh, the pastor of our church walked up to me and said, would you come on staff to do marriage counseling? I was shocked because I didn't, I didn't feel qualified. I'd never had any formal training in that. But I came on staff to do marriage counseling and then 10 months later he left to take a church in Florida and I became the senior pastor of our church at 29 years old. I was terrified. I didn't know how to preach a sermon. I, I didn't know how to, to do a funeral or a wedding. Uh, I didn't know how to manage a staff. Our church was 900 people at that time. And I'm, I had no experience. And I had no friends in the ministry. I, all my friends were in the appliance business. They were worthless at that point in time. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, Bob, how do you pastor somebody, you know? And, and uh, but it just, so I was, I was in ministry, didn't have any friends in ministry, 29 years old. And I was obsessed. Well, I had fear, fear of failure, fear of rejection. All those things were motivating me. And uh, I worked too much. And when I came home, Karen, Karen was, Karen's the best wife in the world. And she was totally supportive of me being in ministry and pastoring and all that. But I would come home after 12 or 14 hour days. And when I came home, again, Karen's a great wife, but she would say, Brent needs this, Julie needs this, I need this. And that's not what I wanted to hear. What I wanted to hear when I came home is, thank you for saving the world from evil. And uh, you're... You're the greatest man on earth and come in. You don't have to lift a finger. We're going to do everything for you. But she didn't do that. Julie needs this, Brent needs this, and I need this. And it's like, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired. And she said, I know you're tired. And, but Julie needs this, Brent needs this, and I need this. And, and so we got in a fight over it. And I just thought she's persecuting the Lord's anointed. And uh, I, I did. That's what I thought. I just thought that. So... I told her that, by the way. Well, we got in a fight. We got in a big fight over it. Now, finally, I decided I'm sleeping on the couch. I'm not going to let, let the sister have the blessing of me being in bed with her. And I think she slept better, actually. For the... <laughs> Honestly. I slept on the couch for several nights. I knew she was wrong. I, I knew she was wrong. No, no doubt in my mind she was wrong. And I was laying there one night, sanctimoniously, and I was laying there, th like third night on the couch, and I was praying for her. And I thought, Lord, help her. You know, she, <laughs> here's what the Lord spoke to me. I'll never forget it. Spoke to my heart. Jimmy, you have communicated to Karen in real terms that the church is more important than she is. Now you repent and you go tell her you're wrong. And I thought, you mean I've spent three nights on the couch to hear that? <laughs> and I went and I told Karen, I said, I'm, Karen, I'm full of fear. I'm, I'm driven. I'm giving everything to the church. And I said, I'm so sorry. And I said, I'm going to leave the ministry. I'll go back in the appliance business. We'll get our lives right. And Karen said, Jimmy, you're supposed to be in the ministry. Don't, don't leave the ministry. But we need you first. And from that point forward, I changed. Because I decided I wasn't going to lay my family on the altar of success. Hey, this is Brent Evans with Exo Marriage, and I want to thank you for listening to the Marriage Today podcast. We believe your marriage has a 100% chance of success if you do it God's way. If you enjoyed today's teaching and want to keep learning, hey, subscribe to the Marriage Today podcast and take some time to leave us a review. Your reviews help us spread the word and can encourage someone else in need. For more great marriage content, check out exomarriage.com where you can see all of our marriage building resources, articles, and live events.